how much did Newcastle pay Blackburn for you? 15.6 million it was. Which was a record in the day, wasn't it? World record, yeah. yeah. I think you'd be priceless. You know, like Mbappe. No, so no, a... I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be compared no, to Mbappe. No. You know what you are, don't you? What? Des de Gat. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Rest is Football with me, Gary Lineker, Micah Richards and Alan Shearer. Um, On today's podcast, um, we've asked for your questions, but we've asked them about transfers, um, all things transfers, how they happen, etc. Let me start with one from All Things Football. In today's market, how much would you all be worth in your prime? Uh, Love the pod, fellas. It's become essential listening for me. Well, thank you very much. How much would you be worth, Micah? Or should we evaluate each other? Okay, yes, that's a better way to do it. In the modern market. Now, are we talking prime? Prime. It says prime. Prime, Prime Micah Richards, when you burst onto the scene. So I would say... Well, just just before you you go, I was uh, linked with Chelsea for 20 million. Yeah, got uh, I was linked with Man U for 25 million. mm. I was linked with Napoli for 30 million. Juve. So I'm just putting it out there. (laughs) Did you say Juve? Juve. You were linked with Juventus? Yes, you? Juve. I think you'd look good in that, kid. Oh, I look brilliant in that, wouldn't you? <laughs> but it was one of those things where there was interested. I spoke to my agent. We had a couple of calls on the phone. Tell people what that's like when you get a call from your agent about a possible transfer. My agent was useless. Let's, <laughs> let, let, let's get it out of there. All I need is renegotiations. And you know your market value, so... We've talked about the extreme money I was on, you know, age 18. You know, I was on 50 grand a week at 18. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's madness. So when you come to do a, a renegotiation three or four years later, that 50 has got to go to 75 or in those sort of realms. So when Juve uh, were interested in me, they always work off net figures, don't they? So yes, well, so you know that playing abroad. I did play in Italy, but no, I know, you I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, so they'll they'll work out the amount of tax and then yeah. yeah, basically. So when they said, "Oh, would he come over for three million euros?" and I'm thinking gross, so I'm doing up the, the calculations and all. I'm thinking I'm not going for no three million euros, but it was net. A week or no, <laughs> <laughs> it was three million euros net a yeah, year, yeah. which worked out double what I was on at the time when they was interested. But you didn't realize. I, I didn't. I didn't realize. I didn't, I, you know, your I, agent didn't. By the way, if your agent got you fifty grand a week at City, he was f- brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but at that time, I only wanted to stay at Man City. So there's different conversations you have with your agent about different clubs. Like, is it, how serious is it? Are they in negotiation with the club? But at this stage, it was just an offer that I'd give to my agent. So they didn't even contact the club yet. So I reckon we've got you down at, oh, I mean, and obviously the game's moved on. I mean, you're young, but yes. it's still, even the market has now gone even more ridiculous, isn't it? So what do you think? How much? For you now, 60, 70 million? More than that, it's 80 million minimum. <laughs> You're a defender. <laughs> You're a... Harry Maguire went for 75 million yeah, but he's, sterling he's a, pounds. He's a proper international. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, okay, we'll give 75 mil? We'll go 75. Okay, 75. Right, 75. Right. Alan, well, I, I saw a thing where they had you valued at something like 200 bloody million. I know, yeah, and probably... What six, seven hundred grand a week you'd be taking home? Like yeah. a player in your prime, you've just said. How, how much did um, Newcastle pay Blackburn for you? Uh, fifteen million. Well, fifteen point six million it was, which was a record in the day, wasn't World it? World record, yeah. You yeah. wouldn't get many goals now for fifteen million, would you? You know, Jack Walker insisted they pay the money up front, the fifteen million pound up front, yeah. which back in then obviously no one could do. So what Newcastle ended up doing was they paid seven and a half million on signature. 
and seven and a half million six months later. But Jack Walker wanted the interest that he'd lost on the seven and a half million for the six months. So they ended up paying 15.6 million for me in the end. God, that's a lot of money for you, isn't it? <laughs> oh, cheap. So I went to Barcelona for in 10 years before that. And in, I suppose, similar kind of vein of, you know, England International, blah, 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 similar to Alan. And that was for 2.2 million or something. Wow. Yeah. Bargain or something. Bargain. <laughs> oh, hey. So what values and what were you saying, so values? I, th- I, I, I think Alan and myself would be fairly similar because our records are kind of compatible. Probably about 222 million, Micah, for both of us. Yeah, net. <laughs> Back of the net, that's what we were interested in. I would, go, I would go with that. You know what? I think you'd be priceless. You know, like Mbappe. No, no, of... no, I'm not I'm, in, I'm not I'm not gonna be compared no, to Mbappe. No, no, but you know no, what I mean. Different level. So basically, if someone wants to buy him and say he's got four years left on his deal, you're yeah. looking at a billion oh. quid. Oh. Realistically, oh. aren't you? And Fatty's got a and he got a um a release clause in his contract for a billion. Yeah. Euros. I don't think it'll be called upon. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> He's at Brighton on loan. Brighton, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there can't be many players on loan um, <laughs> that, that are worth a billion quid. Well, not worth a billion quid, but they've got it in their contracts. Um, uh, interesting question, though. I like uh, it. Yeah, it was. Well, I've got one here from Kieran McMurchy. I hope I've said that right. Hello from Toronto, uh, Canada. Uh, love the podcast already. Thank you very much. Uh, when you were faced with a transfer, how did your relationship to the club and your teammates factor in? Did you worry about the success they would, wouldn't have if you left days before the season started? So he's obviously talking about the club that you were leaving. It's funny, isn't it, when you when you move? Um, I don't know about you, Alan, or you, Micah, but I always think, I mean, I started with my hometown club. You ended up your hometown yep. club. Um, Alan, you were at Manchester City in the early days, obviously. Um, but I mean, obviously, Leicester was everything to me. It was like I'd supported them since I was seven years old. I went with my dad and my granddad every week to Filbert Street, um, watched the matches, managed to get through the youth system got into the first team, um, made my name there, got into the international side. And then there came a point where I thought I had to, you know, try and compete for things and trophies and stuff. And you think to you, you know, th- that's my team I'm leaving. But when you sign for another club, it's like it's almost weird that you automatically care about nothing else but that football team and that football club. Um you kind of take on the old rivalries immediately. You kind of really want to beat Liverpool and and all that sort of stuff. And then, and and you sort of not completely forget your former club. But I I looked at their results, but I, it didn't matter to me anymore. And then I'd go to Barcelona, and I'd you know immediately it's like Real Madrid you don't like and all those things. And then it, the weird thing is though, at the end of my career, when I finished, my feelings came back for Leicester. So it, it is a bizarre thing. You see players kissing the badge and you go, oh, he's played at six clubs. But when you're at that club, I think that's genuine. Were you the same, Alan? Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I left Blackburn, it was probably a couple of weeks before the season. There was a couple of criticisms of me that I'd left. People had bought my shirt in the, that pre-season with a name and the number oh, on. How could you do that, Alan? But uh, I was just going back home, Gary. I was going back to Newcastle. Yeah. They'd made a fortune on me. I'd helped win the league with a, Kenny and the other players. And I just thought, <laughs> I'm going back home. Um, <laughs> and then that's it. You're right. Once you're in that top, then that's all that matters, isn't it? Were you like that? I love City because I was there since I was, I was And 14. you're an ambassador. And I was an ambassador, of course. But I won an FA Cup and a Premier League at Man City. I wouldn't have left if I hadn't have won those because it was like, okay, my my team, my, my place in the team is is up for grabs. Zabaleta's playing so well. But I always wanted to win something with, with Man City. So as long as I won them two trophies, I had done my job, you know? Yes. And that's why I was like, okay, it's time for me to go. But it also works the other way around as well, though, Gary, doesn't it? When the club want to get rid of you or a individual, oh, they're yeah. not bothered about what time of the year it is or whatever. They just want to get rid of you and get out because they've got a balance sheet to keep. So if they want to get rid of you, they get rid of you. 
Yeah, there are two sides to every story. Yeah. Um, this takes me actually quite nicely onto a very good question from uh, Darren. What does a transfer request actually look like? What's the process for a player if they want to leave a club? I can give my notice and leave my work, but football is quite opaque in this. Um, great show already. Thank you. Well, it's you. you would discuss it with your agent at the time. Then you would go and say to the football club that you want to leave and they say, well, no, we're not allowing you to leave. For you to leave, you have to put a transfer request in. You said that it used to be a thing, didn't you? You put in a a written transfer request. Have Mm -hmm. you ever done that? No, never uh, done that. No, neither did I. I don't know whether that actually is a real genuine thing, that you have to put something, I want to leave this football club, signed Alan Shearer. But I think the reason that one of the reasons why that happens, Gary, is that that once you put that in writing, you then forfeit your signing on fees or your bonuses that you're due to get. So then then it's you asking to leave the football club rather than the club selling you. So you're entitled to nothing financially from the club if you if they then sell you. I understand that, but I just wonder if anyone has ever actually done a written transfer request like you, you see it in politics, don't you? When when a member of the cabinet wants to leave, and they they now they now always put them on social media, don't they? they write, dear prime minister, I want to hand <laughs> in my, you know that you, it doesn't kind of. I just wonder if there's ever anybody that's actually done a written transfer request. I've not seen evidence of that. No, they just go on strike and refuse to train now to force their yeah. move, don't they? See, it's interesting, isn't it, with with football? And I think, I mean, the what in. You know, you go back pre-Bosman, um, which changed things dramatically, which for those that you perhaps don't know, um, the Bosman ruling basically meant that at the end of your contract, you're a free agent. Whereas in my day, when you wanted to leave a football club and you finished your contract, you still would the club would demand a fee for you. So, um, for example, when I went to Everton, I told the story about how that happened. But when I went to Everton, the the fee was argued between half a million and 1.1 million, ended up being 800,000 quid. Um, But whereas now, because of the Bosman ruling, he argued that you players at the end of their contracts should just be free to go wherever they want, which was obviously put much more power in the elbow of the footballer. Yeah, oh. well, before that, all the power was with the football club. You couldn't do anything or sign anywhere without them um, releasing your registration, which... Footballers yeah. are treated, uh, going way back, largely like meat in a, yeah. from a butcher's. If you if they wanted you out, they'll sell you and they'll, they'll pretty much tell you where you're going to go. Yeah, it's gone full circle now, though, hasn't it? All the power is with the players now and the agents. Yeah, absolutely. Right, let's get another question. Neil D, for Gary and Micah, what's the funniest language-related incident that has happened to you in an overseas transfer? Uh, Keep up the great work. It's the first one, uh, podcast I presume he means, that I've listened to. Uh, Thanks, Neil. I had one when I went to Barcelona. We hadn't been there just a a two or three months or something, and um, I was with my then wife Michelle and we were looking for houses and we'd found a little villa that we were going to rent uh, but we needed to equip it with with furniture so we went to, we went to a a furniture store and um we were looking for two small bedside tables so the you know by that stage we'd been having lots of lessons but we weren't fluent but we could kind of get by both of us and um we went in and, and the woman said, what, you know, what are you looking for? And I, and, um, and I said, um, um, una mesita con dos cojones. <laughs> now, that means a table with two drawers. Um, but I messed up. I said cojones instead of cajones. So cojones. <laughs> so basically I asked for two bedside table with bollocks. <laughs> Um, um, instead of so there's a very slight difference between drawers which is cajones and balls that are cojones <laughs> and, and the woman burst out laughing and um, then I twigged what I'd done I remember telling Tino Asprey at Newcastle oh, a, week, yeah. a week early the clocks went forward so <laughs> So he come, he come, he come in for training an hour late, and we're all on yeah. the, we're all on the training ground training, and Tino comes stomping in, sheer a b- sheer a b- 
said, because I told him the night before the clocks went forward. Outrageous <laughs> 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 oh, oh, behaviour. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got a, a bit of a, a bad story, to oh, be no. honest. Go on, so uh, I went to Fiorentina uh, the last day of the transfer window. And obviously, I don't speak Italian. You know, I've got C and not B. Yes, basically. No, <laughs> <laughs> And like absolute idiot that I am, I spoke to Balotelli to say, what should I say when I'm greeting someone? You ask Balotelli. Because he's normally good with me. <laughs> and then I go and meet the manager, Montella. I go up to him, I shake his hand and say, testa di cazzo. Oh, oh you God. fool. And I think it means you f head. <laughs> <laughs> the manager. Honestly, oh, uh, 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 and that's the first time I've uh, told this story. Is it? It's, uh, first, it's the first, it's the first uh, time because I think, should I tell it? Should I tell uh, it? Uh, <laughs> and I've gone up to the manager and called him a f head. <laughs> what an idiot! I mean, but you know what? Why didn't I just check? You can just Google it. But I, for some reason, I just believed Bal Balotelli, you yeah. know? Oh, dear. And yeah, um, he set me up. He got me a kipper. Yeah. And uh, to be fair to Montella, he just started laughing. You know what you are, don't you? What? Des did he get? <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's take a breather. <laughs> Got one from uh, Mark. Uh, was there ever a transfer that fell through where a player was going to sign for the club you were playing for and didn't, meaning you never got to play with them at club level and have always wondered, what if? Roy Keane at Blackburn. I remember being out in Southport uh, with Kenny. The I think it was the year after I signed. Uh, and Kenny um, and his wife came in and said, uh, there's a really, really good opportunity, good chance we're going to sign uh, Roy Keane. And <laughs> then about three hours later, Kenny come back in with a face like thunder. He'd have just got the news from Roy that he was going to sign for Manchester United. Oh, dear. <laughs> you can imagine what Roy race. would have done for our team at Blackburn as well, the same as what he did for Man United, but never mind. I remember at Spurs when I, I, I joined them and talking to Terry Venables and he was saying, if we could just get another couple of players. And um, and I was talking to Terry and we thought Peter Beardsley, we might be able to prize him out uh, from your mob. Right. And, um, but didn't quite happen, which was, <laughs> I was really disappointed because I had that amazing relationship with Peter Beardsley on the pitch and he was mm. such a great player to play with. I was um, absolutely gutted on that one. There's a story at Aston Villa when we got, rid of Ben Teke. He was always going to go. He was on fire at the time. We got Adebayo mm. and he came, he did his medical, all but signed the papers. He, there's even a picture of him with the shirt. And the reason why he didn't sign that day, so he's done a picture with the shirts and he's going to sign in the morning. He had a dream that night that he was making the wrong decision. <laughs> I don't know that the higher power or someone told him it's the wrong move for him to come to Aston Villa so they didn't turn up the next day. Pity you didn't have that dream. <laughs> <laughs> you sure he didn't have a nightmare that he had to play with Micah Richards again? <laughs> <laughs> that actually takes me on to one from um, John Spring. Um, he says, I felt so sorry seeing the footage of uh, Paulinha after his transfer to Bayern Munich collapse. Uh, what's it like for a player when that happens and they have to go back to the club they were leaving? Mm. Uh, also, how does that work in the dressing room when everyone else knows he wanted to go? I, I, I did feel for Paulinha. I mean, oh. you know, Fulham's obviously a good football club and, and the, you know, playing some great football and he's been brilliant for them. But, you know, yeah. what is he, about 29, brilliant holding midfield player, and Bayern Munich come in, you think you've done the deal, you've done the medicals, you've pictures taken in yeah. in the club shirt and then, you know, you probably ultimately your dream move falls through because you, Fulham couldn't get a replacement. Oh, 
can you imagine? I mean, I can't, I can't ever remember that happening too many times, but I haven't done all the interviews, the pitches and the buy and shirt, and then to be told, sorry, mate, it's called off. You've got to go back to Fulham. I mean, I would imagine he's like pretty angry at that. I mean, I would, have, I would imagine that that'll be rescued again in January, won't it? I've got one from Nath Hamlet. Can you talk about how difficult it is to move to a different country and play football? Uh, settling in, learning the language, family, etc. I always struggle to understand how fans can turn on new foreign signings so fast. Well, you know how to adapt. You just <laughs> call the manager a <laughs> dickhead. It's as simple as that. Uh, it's over to you, boys. I can't answer that one, so it's over to you. Follow in dressing room. I think it's quite kind of nerve-wracking when you first go abroad because even even when you go to a new club in England, yeah. it's it's kind of tense, and you walk it. It's like you're the new boy at school, isn't it? You, and you come in when everyone else has been there for two or three years, and you come in mid-term or something. So it is quite intimidating, I think. And I think it's, I think it's exacerbated by moving abroad because uh, you know you. you not only that, but certainly back in the day, I mean, everyone seems to speak English. Every footballer seems to speak English nowadays anyway. Um, but, you know, when I went to Barcelona, no one, no one spoke English. Um, I can't, I think the one or two footballers had some, some aspects of the language. But so you kind of, you, you couldn't converse or anything. So you felt like you're just sitting there. What was there the process bit... though? So basically you get the call. Yeah. You're going to Barcelona. Mm. You're, at, you're at home when you get the call. I assume. And then what does the agent say to you? Okay, we're going to Barcelona. Oh, the actual move? Yeah, the oh, actual... Well, it's quite long. It's quite long-winded, but because there was a bit of interest before the World Cup and then eventually signed after the World Cup. And I, I we had this um, bizarre meeting in, I think, was it, what hotel was it? It might have been Connaught or big posh hotel in London. And it was all top secret. And they said, right, we've got you come out in the back, brought me in through the back doors, hustled me up the stairs. Um, and then in this room, there was Terry Venables, and um, who was then manager of of, of Barcelona, um, Juan Gaspar, the vice president of Barcelona. Um, there was Howard Kendall and a couple of people from the um, Everton board because they were selling me. And it was all like hush, hush. And we, we whisked up the back stairs and they got this suite right at the top. And we met them. And basically, I signed the deal, and then they put me on the phone with with the president, who was then Nunez, who ended, who, who ended up in in jail, um, <laughs> and not because of that deal. He's in trouble. And um, so we're so we're all sat around the table, and I signed the contract, and I speak to the president on the phone. He can't speak a word of English. I can't speak a word of Spanish, um, which was very bizarre. And and then that and that was it. We thought, right, we've managed to keep it. And then they went. That Juan Gaspar, the vice president of Barcelona, said, "Right, we booked a we booked a table downstairs in the main restaurant." I said, "Well, why all the sneaky stuff?" <laughs> it was very right not so. And then you go out, and then we agreed the deal, and then actually got married, and then went on honeymoon, and then the next day we went went to Barcelona and, and we arrived, and then they had this presentation day, and you're introduced to the players, and it's kind of awkward when you can't speak. No kick-ups back then. You no, we talked it. about that before. Thank heavens. Did he no, go on a jet, Gary? Did he go on a private jet, or do you? Or was it? No, I don't. No, I don't believe in private jets. I think it should be banned. <laughs> but back then, no, those private jets. No, no I was thinking. Those I mean, private like, jets. But it wasn't but I, like that. I'm seeing we now we with the stayed players. in this like bog standard four-star hotel, which was really disappointing. I thought we were going to be like penthouse and all this jazz, but no. Um, it was. It's not quite how you imagine. But that awkwardness. Um, I mean, you probably had it with the Italian players and stuff. It's that everyone's friendly and nice, but you, you, you just can't you communicate. You can't get with a bump. Can, no, you, know, you can't no, get that's with why a bump. It's so, yeah. so important. Um, particularly back then, it was so, so important to learn the language, um, to adapt to that so sort of thing. So you speak good Spanish? Si. Ooh. Hablo bastante bien. Ooh. Yeah. Um, Tara Jane asks, what is the atmosphere like in the dressing room when a player arrives with a known high price tag? You've got to do the initiation, haven't you? You've got to, it doesn't matter how much you are, how big you are, or you've got to do the player initiation, the singing and all that, haven't you, Micah? Is that a thing? Oh, that wasn't, thank heavens, that wasn't a thing, but you'd have loved it, Al, because you, <laughs> you know, you love belting out a tune, don't you? 
<laughs> did you well, do I that? Alan? Uh, yeah, we had to. All, we all had to sing. Yeah, we had to get sing at the um, the first Friday night you're away, or the first time you're in the dressing room, whenever it is. Then you've got to stand up and sing in front of the lads. Yeah, got to I'd do have that. Died a million deaths if that had been a thing. What did you sing, Alan? Uh, Micah, you know me better than that. You know which song I sing now. Come on. I, I don't. The, Just spell it out. The go on, Al. Go on, Al. Want to hear give, it? Give us a few bars. No, Al. it's all night long, guys. You know what it is. You're not going to get any singing out of me on this. We need to encourage people to listen, not to make them turn off. <laughs> that's, that's a very good point. Did you have to do any initiation? Things? Oh, yeah, I had to do Usher. Usher? <laughs> Pre-season. Uh, under Sherwood in Portugal, I think we was. Uh, it was seven o'clock on the dot. Oh my! I was. I've never. I. You know me. Big Meats is never nervous. You know me, uh, guys. No, Al, you know me by now. But singing, no, yeah. it's, it's not Can my you bag. I, I'm terrible. As I well. was never so nervous within all my life. Really? I just, horrible. Horrible. <laughs> You need a drink, you need a bevy to... What, to what, what, it? <laughs> which, which Usher tune? Not that I'll know. It, probably, it was but... Usher, 7 o'clock. Uh, oh, that's the name of the song. I thought seven that's o- what time you had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you idiot! <laughs> <laughs> the cat is <saw. laughs> Yeah, oh, sorry, I'm such a... He's not, he's, not, you know, he's not top of my playlist. <laughs> uh, poor, apologies. Um, I've got one question for you here from Liam Frost, Alan. Um, what kind of signing would take Newcastle to the next level? Which is the Ooh. next level for Newcastle at the start of this season? They've left them short, themselves short with a the centre off. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I think they've signed some very good, exciting young talent. They've got a plan there, haven't they? They're not just signing. Yeah, willing, they have. Really. They have got a plan. Yeah, but. I don't know. There's a, just a tiny part of me that they've 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 improved the squad. There's no doubt about that. Um, but have they massively improved the eleven? Mm, probably not. Not yet. Mm. Not yet. Who would you like to see though? Like a so when I was at Man City, uh, and I'll talk that a bit later. But we signed Robinho. Yeah, which took us to the to the next level. Who would you like to see? Someone like Osserman, maybe yeah, from Napoli. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I know they've got Wilson and um, Isak, uh, but I don't, I don't think you can have too many up top. You've always got different options, and you can rotate. I think he would have been very good signing. Yeah, but they've done it differently that we thought, haven't they? In Newcastle, they've done it in a more measured way rather than going out and buying that big name. Um, but that, w- that would be my only slight concern was I know they've improved their squad, but I'm not 100% certain they've improved the 11. Leading from your comment there, Mike, I've got a question from Helen that says, uh, which big signing player came in that didn't quite happen? And I think that's what you were alluding to. Rubinho came in from Real Madrid. He was outstanding. Didn't quite happen for him, it, though, did it? In training, he used to do things that I'd never seen before. He had Alano. Do you remember Alano? Yeah. For City, midfielder, great technically. But Rubinho had these skills. He wasn't, like, fast, like, like running fast, but he was sharp. You know, these first, like, five yards. And he had these mad skills where he could step over and just leave someone for, for dead. But it wasn't his fault. I've got to say, it wasn't his fault. We was under Mark Hughes and we were trying to get attacking players. We had Steven Island, who was playing really well, Alano and Rubinho, really good front sort of line. Bellamy, I think, was there at the time as well. But we was trying to play from back to front with all like rotations, but we just didn't have it. We had too much defensive players who didn't want to play the ball forward. And we had attacking players who didn't really want to, to work out. So we used to just give the ball to Rubinho and say, okay, dribble past as many players as you can. And I remember he's got a good goal against Chelsea earlier on. He's, uh, he played really well against Everton away, but it wasn't his fault. He's, he was too good for what we was able to to give him in terms of the support going forward. Just didn't mm. work for him. Yeah. Yeah. A good example. Um, I've got one from Chris Orton. What is the most bizarre incentive you've heard of to get a player to sign for a club? Well, I remember Gazza tells a story, doesn't he? Um, I think that, I think he, 
he kept when I can't remember whether it might have been when he was signing for Spurs or someone else. I think it was actually that I think he was talking to Irving Scholar who who, who signed me as well. And I think he said, right. He said, get me a house. And they got him a house. And he says, well, the house has got a garage, so I need a car. So then they got him in a car. And then I think he wanted, he said, right, okay, um, can I have a car for my dad as well? And he just kept going, I think, and, and all these things. <laughs> um, but most people just do the contract. <laughs> so they just, just give him it. Just... Uh, I, 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 there's something else as well, quite, quite f- sunbed, sunbed. That's what, what he is. <laughs> sunbed. <laughs> that was it. That was it. I remember now. <laughs> Hilarious. Oh, that is brilliant. Yeah. I got one that's a kind of personal one here, but it, it made me think of um, how gutted I actually was because it's um, from Gareth Doma. Um, when signing for Tottenham in 1989, how did you feel when Chris Waddle left for Marseille that summer? I'll never forget it. I'd, I'd signed for Spurs, and one of, the, one of the main reasons for signing for them was Chris Waddle had a great understanding with him, and he was a fantastic player for. for that that whip the ball in, you know, great crosser of the football, wonderful footballer. And I'd sign, and I was, and then I went on um, on holiday in the summer, and I was on the beach, and I I got a phone call that said Chris Waddle's just signed for Marseille. <laughs> oh, honestly, honestly, it, it ruined it ruined my holiday. It was like someone had snatched 10, 15 goals a season <laughs> out of my pocket. <laughs> I, f- oh, I, was, I, was I wonder if James Madison felt that way when he found out Harry Kane was gone. He mu- he must have had a feeling though. I mean, I had no idea. But the thing is that um, when Chris went to Marseille, Tottenham's financial plight uh, became a big thing. But yeah, I bet uh, you were devastated. Eh? <laughs> yeah, I got it. Absolutely got it. <laughs> I might need a time to get over it, so I'll end this show now. Um, (laughs) Thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much for your questions, uh, as ever. Uh, We've got another episode of uh, your questions on uh, international football, uh, which we're going to put out at the end of the week. Um, So thanks for listening to this one, and please do listen to that one as well from me. Uh, Gary, goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye from me. 